This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. All right, so I get a lot of questions about signed books and In the Blood coming May 17th, but you can pre-order some signed copies now if you go to my website, officialjackcar.com, go to the blog section, and right at the top, there's a campaign to support local independent bookstores. So I've done that for the last, uh, this is the third time that I've done it. Did it for Savage Son, did it for the last book, The Devil's Hand. And I had uh, these book plates for those that you could only get from those independent bookstores. So to try to push some traffic there uh, away from the Amazon easy button uh, and to support these local independent bookstores, uh, I did that for the last two. And then this time I wanted to up the game a little bit because this is a sniper centric novel of violent resolutions. And I wanted to do something a little different. So I shot through the title page after I signed them. So Simon and Schuster sent out a bunch of copies of the title page, and this is in advance reader's edition right here. So the actual one will be the hardcover, but uh, I shot through those, uh, signed them and then shot through them and sent them back to Simon and Schuster. So when the book is printed, that will be bound into the book. So a certain number of those were going to different independent bookstores across the country to help them out. And you can find them on my website, officialjackcar.com, go to the blog and the participating independent bookstores will be there and the ones that are sold out will have lines through them. But uh, the ones that are still in red, you can click on those and order a signed copy if you so choose. So uh, that's in the blood and that's this year's uh, campaign to support local independent bookstores. Welcome to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today, Glenn Eberly. You might know him from Everly Stocks, the backpack company, but he has had quite the journey. He competed in the 1984 Winter Olympics in Sarajevo as a biathlete. He flew a variety of airframes in the United States military before starting the backpack company that we know as Everly Stock. Incredible guy. You can go to everlystock.com. They have a great video about his background under the about section, and you can go to Glenn Eberly Stock on the social channels on Instagram there and follow his journey. Had a great time talking to him. So now, without further ado, Glenn Eberly. Awesome. Well, thank you for running in. I so appreciate you doing that. This is uh, this is awesome to be able to talk to you for a little bit here. Oh, it, it's my honor. Thanks for, oh. thanks for the invitation. Of course, yeah. of course. Well, I, the the ranch looks amazing, and I was so uh, I'm so looking forward to to getting up there at the maybe the next event or the one after. Um, but it looks so beautiful up there. That's one of the things that's on my uh, on my list for the future is have that place. I mean, we're here in Park City, and it's beautiful, but it's nice to get away even from home yeah. base and just be out there with a a cabin and uh, and not all the not all of this <laughs> all of this connectivity. I, and it's true, and and in fact. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, first of all, you have an open inv- invitation. I mean, mm-hmm. we'll do it again this year and, and obviously you'll be, you'll be invited to that, but then also just a good place to escape. If you ever just want to get away, it's uh, let me know. Cause it's uh, I go there often and sometimes by myself, but it's best with company and whoever uh, they are. And uh, this is blast and fire up the sawmill and make something, or you can just go out and catch a little tiny fish or you know, climb up the mountain and, uh, and wolves howling in the woods at night. It's a, oh. it's a pretty, Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Around here for this latest book, my, uh, uh, my fifth one that comes out in May, um, I had to, I had to go somewhere else and it wasn't very far, but there were a couple Airbnbs just around town that my, my wife found. And so I'd go to those Airbnbs and one of them, the second one, um, is, was just a cabin and had a wood burning, wood, uh, burning fire uh, stove right in the corner. And everything was so close. Cause it was tiny. It was just a log cabin. So it was stove, small kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, deck, it was perfect. It was perfect. So I'd be outside just chopping wood, feeding that fire, and then just typing away. Uh, and then I'd have my binos out there and I'd tell the kids at night, hey, I'm going to flip on the lights and they could see me from the, our house. They could look up and they could see me flip the light switch across town, essentially. Um, but uh, I, I, having a place like that to go is uh, is so nice to be able to take a breath and not have the constant uh, you know, buzzing uh, that we have in our phones and computers and, and all of yeah. that. It's nice not to be reachable for a while. Yeah, I did, uh, to be honest, get Starlink internet up there, but I don't really uh, use it if I don't want to. So I have the choice. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Only for emergencies. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And you grew up, so did you grew up going to that ranch and you grew up in, in McCall and grew up in, yeah. uh, in, in Idaho up there. What was that like growing up? And what did your, what did your family do that, uh, that brought you guys there? Okay, sure. Well, my dad was an airline pilot, so he could live wherever he wanted. And, uh, uh, and really, you know, he was a Westerner at heart. Uh, we were, we were a skiing family, so we did, did all, all forms of skiing. And, uh, uh, in the course of their lives, my parents found central Idaho and this little town McCall, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and dad, although he was an airline pilot, had always been, wanted to be a veterinarian or a doctor. And so in the, up there, he started looking around at these ranches and decided that he'd buy one. And, uh, and so he'd be gone to the airline for a few days and then come back and, and be a rancher for a few days. And that was sort of his life until he retired after which, uh, he decided to sell the cattle ranches because he decided how much it sucked to be a full-time cattle rancher. <laughs> and, uh, and he bought this thing out in the wilderness that's basically a retreat at this point, although sort of built also around hunting and, uh, and uh, wilderness activities, which is really, you know, appropriate to our brand. So, so Everly Stock uses it sort of alongside the yeah. brand. Now, did you grow up hunting as well as skiing or did that come later? Or was it shooting first and then into hunting or how did that uh, transpire? Right. Well, definitely skiing um, was first. And, and so we were in Idaho. Um, and my dad had been an outdoorsman since he was a kid, so he was never a big hunter, but, uh, but at the same time, he is the guy that introduced me to it, you know, uh, on one of those ranches when I was 14, I, I shot my first deer. Funny story, actually, I, he'd given me this old, uh, 30, 40 Krag rifle to use, and it was his father's rifle and, uh, and then his, and he'd had it when he was a kid and, uh, and it terrified me, you know, steel butt plate. And, uh, and I was, you know, a scrawny little skinny kid and, uh, but I could shoot it. Um, and this, when I was 14, I had just prior to that been introduced to the sport of biathlon where you ski and shoot. And so I was a good, uh, cross country ski racer at the time. I later, when I fell out muscularly, I could be, I was, I was better at all time, but when I was a kid, I was pretty, pretty scrawny, but I could, but I could go fast on cross country skis. So, um, in our town, there was a guy that had been to the 76 Olympics in this sport of biathlon, which a lot of Americans at that time hadn't even heard of. Um, but we thought that was pretty cool because you could ski around with a gun and stop and shoot it once in a while. Mm -hmm. I liked the part. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, I, I actually turned out to be good at the blend of those two really disparate dis disciplines and, and learned how to shoot. And then uh, soon after that, my dad took me uh, deer hunting on his ranch and i remember at dawn one morning walking across this field by myself and looking up and uh and seeing these two bucks mule deer bucks outlined on the skyline way up me and i, and I was smart enough to know that they were above me and looking down at me and if i didn't you know try, try it i'd never see them again so um that was the smart part the smart part was, the, the dumb part was actually trying but still i thought well i don't know so i, I took this crag and i and i put the bead on the front of one of them. And then I thought, well, he's way up there. The bead covers the deer. So I basically decided to raise it a little bit, pull the trigger, boom, gun goes off and the deer turns around and runs. I thought, oh, I must've missed him. So darn. And the other one's still standing there looking at me though. So I do the same exact same thing. I put the, the side on him and raise it a little bit, pull the trigger. He runs too. I'm like, ah, shoot. So I run around the mountain, try to find him, try to find their tracks. I don't see any tracks. I'm looking and looking at, and I, and I climb up, come over up onto this little knoll. And there's a dead deer lying there. I'm like, whoa, I yell across the canyon at my dad, dad, I got one. And, uh, and then I'm thinking, wait, wait a minute. They both did the same thing. This is my confession of, of innocent poaching when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they might come after you uh, this day and age. Uh, so I looked down at the bottom of the hill. The other one's lying in the fence down there. I'm like, geez, I, you know, it turned out they were both hard shots. Probably the best two shots I've ever taken a game, honestly. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I will not claim to be a great marksman since then I've screwed up a lot of things, but, but I can do it at, at times. Anyway, that's, that's, that was really my introduction to hunting. And then, and that was really my first time, you know, getting into the, uh, the, the processing of a deer, uh, it turned out, to be um, and, but my family ate those deer all winter that year. And, uh, and it really, I remember that, you know, the, the direct appreciation for the fact that I had harvested them, that they tasted good, that they put food on the table. And that, you know, the whole kind of, you know, ancient time honored tradition of, of, of harvesting your own game and, 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 and then processing it was really an epiphany for me. It was a great, it was a great thing to experience. And, and since then I've, you know, had mixed uh, experiences with it all the way through life, but still enjoy going out and trying to do that. Oh yeah. No, I, do you remember how, do you still have that rifle? 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So dad passed, uh, last spring and, uh, that rifle was, uh, was, was something that I decided I was going to keep. So I, I do still have it. Oh, That's yeah. a trip. Yeah, my dad's old uh, 3030, pre-64, 3030 that he, he bought in a pawn shop in Santa Barbara in like 1955 or something like that when he was like nine or 10 years old and you could just do that back then. Um, and uh, yeah, so I still have that today. I took it out hunting a couple of years ago and got something with it. And it's uh, it's, it's really cool to go and, uh, you know, not have all the the fancy scopes and everything sighted in and be able to know you can reach out there and just be, you know, it's nice to have something that's, that's just old and you have a connection to, and there's, there's something really, really special about that, I think. So, um, but, but you, uh, you are a good shot. I mean, <laughs> you went to the 1984 Olympics as a biathlete. So, uh, yeah. so, but you're skiing, you're, you're, you're doing, um, uh, downhill, you're doing alpine skiing, you're doing, uh, cross country. You find out about biathlon. Is that because up in McCall, there's some sort of a biathlon club up there? Is that, uh, is that how you found it? Well, you know, we're talking like mid seventies and, uh, or late seventies, I guess at this point, um, there were four people in town that cross country skied. So it wasn't like, it was okay. Four. But as, as I said, from, from our town, uh, I sort of, one of my childhood heroes was a, a guy who had been to the 76 Olympics on, on, in the, on the biathlon team. And, uh, and somewhere along the way, I think those guys came through town and, and, um, they were, they weren't so much recruiting, you know, for future members of the team as, as, you know, I guess they were in a way, but they were basically looking for talent and I, I'm somewhere, uh, each year when you went to the, the national championships in cross country ski racing, um, they were called the junior nationals, I guess, back then. And so I'd go to the, we'd go to the junior nationals and at the end of them, there, there would typically be a biathlon race put on by the U S biathlon team. And, um, and that, I think the intersection of having that guy in town and then having a guy there that would teach me how to shoot a rifle and back. Do you remember there was a thing called the civilian marksmanship program? I oh, don't yeah. remember the, but, but they, but they basically would give 22s out to local clubs um, and a fellow in town got us some of those 22s to, to practice with. And so, so I kind of had a head start on learning about the sport before I did it at the national championships and then uh, did well at national championships again, because I think that my, I was a really good Nordic skier and would have been better at it had I been more disciplined and trained harder. But still, I, you know, I went to the 84 Olympics, as you said, and uh, went to world championships from 81 through 87. So, wow traveling with the team, I guess it was, and, uh, and a great chapter of my life. Uh, but the truth is also like, it's funny people go, Oh, you went to the Olympics. And, and I'm like, yeah, I guess I did. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and, you're an Olympian. Uh, the next question of course is, well, did you win? And you go, uh, uh, <laughs> all you have to say you know, is the, I was in biathlon <laughs> and, yeah. and you're an American. You don't have an accent. Eighties. We were competing against the Russians and the East Germans, both of whom had excellent, you know, professionalized doping programs and, and, <laughs> by the government. And, uh, and so it was pretty tough to compete against them. Interestingly, uh, as that all unfolded though, the first thing that I, I was, that I was involved in that happened, that was, it was pretty cool. And I've uh, not told the story to you, so I'll just tell it briefly, but, um, you know, in those days, skis were getting faster, the, you know, uh, plastic bases came along with this stuff called P-Tex on them that made you go faster over the snow. Uh, the skis themselves were sometimes not the best and the conditions all sometimes weren't the best. So once in a while, no matter how good of a skier you were, you know, you'd wreck. And, and if you're in a biathlon race with a rifle on your back in those days, we were using these basically target rifles on just target rifle. And, uh, and often if you fell, you'd stand up and your rifle would be broken in half, uh, with the short grain across the wood pistol grip mm. and the race is over and you have to buy a new rifle stock or try to repair that one or whatever. So having gone through that process a number of times and being a fairly impoverished young man, <laughs> I, uh, uh, decided to try to, um, improve upon the rifle stock to make one that wouldn't, well, first of all, just to make one so I could not be buying them. And then secondly, I thought I could try to make one that wouldn't break if you fell. And this was all while I was in, co in college. And so, uh, uh, I was at Dartmouth college and they had a great workshop. And you think about, first of all, how the world's changed since the eighties. Cause I could go into the college workshop with rifles and work on them. That's kind of cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. Especially at Dartmouth. Yeah. That's not happening today. Yes. And they're not doing that. Anymore. No. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, and while there, the, the, this project kind of evolved into, uh, over the space of about a year, um, my proving the concept by making a rifle that was 
an awful lot stronger and an awful lot lighter than the other one. And the, the latter part, I think, is pretty interesting because the rifles that we were carrying at the, at the, in the 80s weighed 11 and a half pounds. And, uh, and the premise, of course, if you think about it, is that, you know, target rifles are heavy because the inertia of the rifle, you know, kind of dampens the natural shaking that you have, particularly when you're shooting offhand. And, uh, and so, you know, biathletes assumed you had to have a heavy rifle to shoot accurately when you're standing there with no support and skin tight clothing. And, uh, uh, I was the, really the first to realize that you could shoot a lightweight rifle accurately also. So I took four pounds off the weight of the rifle, went from 11 and a half pounds to seven and a half pounds. And, and suddenly then the Americans that had these magic rifles compared to everybody else in the world could go a lot faster. And so that was our edge in like 86, 87, 86, we showed up to the world championships with these things and the Europeans' minds were just blown. They saw these things the Americans had and realized that we suddenly had an advantage. And suddenly we were in the, in the fight you yeah. know, where, where you, I don't care if you're doping or not, when you take four pounds off the other guy's back, he can, ski, he can, he can, he can go head to head with you. So that kind of was the moment when the American team moved forward in the rankings and, and then corresponding with that soon after the you know, fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, the, the Eastern countries programs fell apart and and now that playing field out in that sport is more, is more even there are a lot of good americans and and they sort of you know who's best moves around in, in the world but but it was kind of cool to be right in that sport at that time when big changes happen and to personally have really driven a lot of the changes yeah no i love that i love your, your story and people can go to the everly stock website and there's a great video when you hit about and there's this amazing you know four or five minute video there that that shows some old pictures of you competing and and uh i, I love it it's a, you guys did a great job with that um but i love I have, biathlon I, biathlon is my favorite sport to watch uh biathlon and ufc like yeah, I, cool. I, those are the two things that I like to like to watch, uh, boxing when I was growing up as a, as a kid, I like to watch, but, uh, these days it's mostly UFC if I can in juggling the kids, but for the Olympics, I taped, I always tape by uh, tape DVR, whatever it is now, uh, all the biathlon events. I try to figure it out. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to record and all that. I absolutely love all the different events because there's so many, um, different yeah. ones. And, uh, I love the penalty laps and I love how it can change so quickly. Obviously I love that there's a weapon involved. Um, but growing up, I just loved that. And I always wanted to get into it as a kid, but we didn't have, you know, same thing growing up in the eighties. Like we, we barely, we, we skied, but we barely got to ski, uh, you know, it was every now and again type of a thing. And, uh, I always wanted to get into that. So now I'm going to, in a future novel, I'm going to have a character that has a background in biathlon, which is going to force me to get down to soldier hollow here down the road and, uh, and do it. I mean, I have my, I have my skate skis. I have my classic ski, but I've been so busy the last couple of years. I haven't even gotten out to do that. Um, my oh, wife cool. goes out all the time. Um, but, uh, with our dog, but, uh, I want to get, get on the skis and then get to soldier hollow and start doing it. I, I think it'd be so much fun to do. I love watching it. Um, but when you made those changes, was there not a, um, uh, like a list of things you had to have on your rifle, like a barrel length and a weight and different things like that. Was there a, was it like a stock car or was it, were there no rules back then? And you just whoosh, took four pounds off. Uh, the latter really, it, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, there, there were some, there were some rules you had to have like a minimum trigger pull weight in the rifle and that, mm. that rule's been out there for a long time, you know, so you couldn't have a hair trigger for example, but that was as much a safety thing as, as, as a level of the playing field thing, I think. Mm. Uh, but after that, after the 86 world championships, when the U S team showed up with these completely different looking rifles than anybody else in the world had the, you know, you think about who the governor the governing body of that sport would be, it's the Europeans. And so they all, you know, there's a big, big ruckus and a big clamor and, and they wrote a rule that said you my my rifle stocks were skeletonized. And so they wrote a rule that said you, you couldn't have a skeletonized rifle stock and, uh, or, or, or stock with holes in it is actually what they wrote. Mm. And we're all bullshit. We, we, we have them already. And so, so our delegation fought off the, this new rule that they'd written. And, uh, in, in the end, um, they acquiesced and they, they basically said, okay, how much does that thing weigh? And we said seven and a half pounds. And that became then the floor of the biathlon rifle. So that, so, so I'm the guy that set that NASCAR standard. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> Which again, everybody's forgotten. It. It's it's an interesting story, and at this point, it doesn't matter much. But it's pretty cool to have been there in that moment and really have made a breakthrough, both in in the you know because I I think if the other thing that's happened um, 
is that you mentioned that the sport's pretty interesting to watch now. It's it's become more dynamic. You know, where it used to be a little bit more methodical, and you mm-hmm. know, there was sort of this um, uh, you know visible transition from skiing to shooting, where guys would kind of slow down and get get in the zone, and and it was the way the sport was done then. Huh. But now it's, it's hammer down, baby. It's oh, pretty yeah. impressive, guys, and uh, and and so the sport is is. It's it is fascinating and fun to watch. Oh yeah, sure. it's amazing. The Sochi course was amazing at the Sochi Olympics. That was a beautiful course. Um, I, I love watching it. I love watching the coaches, and I love looking at what optics they have. I'm like, all right, those Northern Europeans are on Swarovskis. I'm like, what is that thing over there? Like, I like I like looking at all the gear. I'm, of course, because I'm a gear person. I love look. I love how you how you uh, how you load. You know, cock the thing, load. You know, with your finger, trigger finger, and all that. It's just uh, it's it's. I absolutely love it. Um, what's, what is the history also of, of biathlon? Is it, uh, yeah. How, well, how did it, and how has it evolved since you, cause it's been over 30 years since you made that change. That's still, uh, that, that's still in place today. As far as the weight of that rifle, it's been over 30 years since you, you did that. Um, and nothing, and it has not had, that has not changed. Um, but yeah, what's the history of, uh, of biathlon? Well, the, you know, the sport goes way back to Scandinavia. People look at it and they think, oh, that's a weird sport. You're skiing and, and with guns, why? why? You know, and, and, and so um, I don't think anybody knows the true history of it, but, but it's, I, I'm told that early biathlon races actually evolved right along with ski races and maybe even were the first ski races because um, in these uh, villages in Norway and Sweden and, and wherever, um, you know, in the wintertime, they were on skis and they'd run off through the forest on their skis. Uh, you know, they were hunters. And so uh, hunting clubs and ski clubs sort of evolved together. Mm-hmm. And, and running around with a rifle on skis was, was normal back in those days. Um, that also then, you know, evolved into militaries in, in Scandinavia, having ski troops and, uh, and you know, that, that discipline of, of skiing and stopping to shoot was part of their culture, which, which, you know, early on trans translated into an Olympic sport, which became by, which was called biathlon. Um, so, so really it's been there alongside ski racing all the way along is sort of a more interesting, uh, form of it than just plain, you know, cross country ski racing, which is a great sport, but it's, it's very direct and very consistent and the same thing all the way through, you know, it's more about pacing where biathlon is about, you know, a vast gulf between the, the metal state of shooting and the metal state of hammer down skiing and, and making the transition between the two back and forth. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, great, great sport for, you know, for disciplining your brain and your mind to focus on the immediate mo- moment and the task at hand and seeing through the fog of, you know, your body <laughs> vibrating and pulse going crazy when you're trying to shoot. So um, that, it, that was pretty cool. As far as the, 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 history of it go it's basically as i say been there along side skiing yeah it's been 30 years since i was in the fight and, and made those changes it's not changed a whole bunch i'll tell you a quick interesting story um because because sometimes along the way somebody does remember my my history and uh so this year uh, at the shot show i'm in the Ever- eberly stock booth talking to somebody and i look over and you could i could see this little i you, you could pick him out as a germ you know from across the room right and, and so i see this little kind of uh stocky balding german fellow um just kind of vibrating over there waiting to talk to me and so i finished my conversation and went over and introduced myself and i said i can tell you're waiting to talk to me and he said yeah you know uh i want to talk to you about biathlon and i'm like okay didn't see that coming and and then he says you're involved in this sport yeah yeah and so he goes well i want to make a new rifle i think we can beat Anschutz." (laughs) and i was like what? <laughs> and so he basically invited me to participate in the development of a, of a new biathlon rifle with two objectives. The first would be to make it less expensive so that, the, so that there's an entry level, mm. you know, ability for it. Because right now, if a teenager wanted to start biathlon, the gun costs $3,500. Right. So there are barriers to entry. Um, but then also this German dude, and Antrich is a German company. Everybody in the world uses those rifles. This, this guy's like has dissected the rifle and has all these points of play that he thinks it could be made better. And I thought that was pretty cool. I, you know, I, I really have no business going and doing that, but I have other good people to run this company. And so 
<laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> I love it. Anyway. Well, I'm, when that comes out, I'm going to get one. I was going to ask you, but actually for like the last two years, since we met in person at SHOT Show with Black Rifle guys, like two or three years ago, um, I've been meaning to reach out to you and say, Hey, which, which, what rifle should I get? It's kind of confusing, uh, which one to yeah. get and you know, all that stuff. But, uh, somebody sent me this recently. They sent me, uh, let's see, here it is, uh, from outdoor life. And, uh, this one that says the world's best biathlon rifle and shoots 1827 F. I don't know if you can see that, uh, 100%. right there. You guys can see that right there. Like that's, that thing looks space age that orange. I mean, that thing is crazy right there. Jeez. Um, but I have yeah. one on, one's on my list. It's part of, part of research for uh, one of these future novels. Yeah. So Jack, when you do that, I'd, I'd love to come down and, 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 and run it with you. That'd be fun. That'd be yeah. awesome. That would be awesome. I have to get back in shape though. Like I've been so yeah. busy with the books and everything else, the, uh, sleeping and, uh, and eating right and exercising have kind of gone to the bottom of my priority list, but, uh, they need to work their way back up there this, uh, this year this is my year to get organized. Okay. So they do. But on the other hand, if you and I go out together, you don't have to be in good shape. <laughs> I don't know. I see pictures of you. You're hiking through the mountains and you know, I know it's, it's tough out there. And, and, uh, and you, you posted some crazy stuff this last year in the river, like falling in the river and like, and you have your, your plane out there. And I want to ask you all about that stuff. But I, I also want to ask you about the 1984 Olympics because I was 10 and I was glued to our TV. And I still remember to this day, the commercials. I remember the like behind the scene athlete profiles. And I, I remember the mountains, Sarajevo, and just the way that it was filmed. Um, Cause I don't really, obviously 1980 Olympics, you know, it didn't, we didn't uh, winter, right. winter side of the house anyway. Um, but uh, so 84 was like the one that I really remember um, Los Angeles and, and Sarajevo, of course, but I remember those mountains and I remember those athlete profiles. And I remember the ones they did not just on us athletes, but they did it for, for, for international athletes. And I remember they did some on cross country skiers and by athletes. And I was just enthralled with that. So what was it like to go there? Uh, and obviously what happened, you know, years later, I mean, they, they, what they showed me as a 10 year old kid, it was so beautiful. And then to know that yeah. it just, you know, descended into chaos, um, you know, not too long after, um, what was it like to, to go there and compete in, uh, in those Olympics? Well, it was, so for, first of all, I was, I was a young man. I was, I was 19 at the time. I think I was the youngest, uh, American to ever make the bio, the Olympic biathlon team, just in the, in the timing of it all. Um, and so, but I was also a tiger. I mean, I really had my eye on, on, you know, winning, even though that was a long shot for an American. Um, and, performed well against my peers on the U S team, uh, <laughs> going, getting, getting ready to go to the Olympics. You know, uh, there were six guys selected for the team. Uh, and so you each were going to get to probably do one of the individual race. Some of them got to do two, but then basically out of the six, you were always competing for who got to be on the relay team. And I was the fastest lead guy. I was the fastest across the kind of the opening, you know, the scramble of the, where everybody starts together in the field. So I usually started our relay teams and, uh, and, getting ready for the Olympics. Uh, we were, we were racing in world cup races through Europe. One of them was in a place called Ant Selva or Antwold, depending on whether you, you say the German or Italian name of this little town in Northern Italy, beautiful, just a spectacular place. And, uh, and I'm in this race and I'm, and I'm hammered down doing well and go across a road crossing and get hit by a car in the middle of a biathlon. Race. What? And so, <laughs> so bang, knocks me down. And I, uh, the car stops and I'm looking at the side of a car. He skied over my, he's run over my skis, but they still look like they're okay. And there's pieces of chrome lying there, lying there. And I, and I, you know, get out back away just kind of like, you know, stunned, but then get back in the race and go and still did okay. But, uh, I, because it's, it's colorful first of all, but secondly, then while at the Olympics, uh, I mean, you know, walking into the stadium behind the iron curtain, sort of, even though you it was sort of in that mid grade, but it was still, you know, it was dominated in, in the Russian sphere of influence. So you really felt this sort of weird eeriness whenever you went to Eastern Europe back in the eighties. Uh, and, and, and I remember that, you know, sort of that sense of the place, but also, as you said, beautiful place. Uh, and then, yeah, walking into the, the stadium and that parade that it, that, it, that opens the Olympics and, and seeing this stadium in the middle of that place erupt with American flags and cheering was, I mean, I felt a lot of, you know, national pride in that moment. And then, uh, uh, the actual venue for biathlon was up on the, or I can't remember, or bits plateau or something like that. I can't remember the name of it exactly now. It's been a long time, but anyway, uh, we stayed in a, in a pretty nice place across from, 
uh, the, the, the stadium where the Nordic races and biathlon races both took place. And uh, I made the uh, cut for the 20 kilometer ski race. So I did that and actually did well. I, I, I'm proud of the fact that on that day, uh, there was a blizzard. I mean, it was a, it was a brutal snowstorm with, you know, strong crosswinds pulling big snowflakes flakes across the, the shooting range. And, uh, and I, you know, we had, you had 20 shots in a 20 K race and I had the fourth best shooting that day. Wow. Uh, you know, in the 20 where most guys missed more than that wow. <laughs> because of the, I'm like, yeah, you know, then I could shoot No, I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and did, you know, admirably well in the, in the race. I was in the middle of the pack, but that was about where America, if you, if you're in the middle of the pack, then as America, right. you were doing fine. Uh, Anyway, I had to actually made the cut for the relay team. And the, the, the heartbreak part of the whole Olympics for me in retrospect was that my coaches basically looked at me and said, well, you're young. You're going to have another one of these, you know, another chance at this. Uh, we're going to put this other fellow on the team because this is his last Olympics. And I was like, no, I mean, I, I did this like, no, it's unjust. I made, I, I made that, but they used that, that the, the results of the one, the race where I got hit by a car was factored. I was like, no, oh. <laughs> so that, that the sad thing, and you know, at the moment was that that really just the, the, the injustice of that really was a blow to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I, you know, saddened by it. Um, and, and, uh, jaded by it in a way that I, it's not normal for me. I, I normally just, you know, stuff like that rolls off my back, but that was a deep, deep dig. And then as it turned out with, through another, you know, long and crazy story, um, I always made the team. I was, I was one of the best Americans along the, the whole time I was doing it and, uh, and walked into the trials for the 88 Olympics knowing that I was going to make the team and also just fully expecting to, you know, to have a shot at the podium when we got there. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, the hand of God basically through various things in the course of those Olympic trials kept me off the team. I just, I look at back at that and I'm like, wow, there are so many minute, like, like, I think I had, uh, to, to, to knock down a biathlon target, the, the bullet has to go through a hole in the steel plate and hit the, the, the plate behind it and, it and it knocks it back. And then a, another plate flips up in front of the target and it, the, the target that you shot at goes from black to white. If you hit it, if, if half the bullet, you know, hits the edge of the hole, if more than half go, goes through the hole, then the physics of it is that the target will go down. If it's mm -hmm. less than half the, the target stands. And so I think I had three split bullet shots in the course of those trials, any one of which would have put me on the team. <laughs> and, and, uh, terrible skis. You know, I was out there just hammering it down with these slow skis and, and, uh, and my, these guys that were not as good at me would just glide behind and be like, Oh shit, I'm screwed. So anyway, after this really hard fought battle in 88, uh, I was, I, I the, after the last race, I was like, hey, I know, I know I'm close. I know I'm close. And I just was, you know, waiting on pins and needles to see if I made it or not. And, uh, and, and just in shock that I might not because I, I, I was one of the main guys to go. Right. And, uh, uh, the, one of the fellows who I bumped off the 84 team, uh, came and knocked on my door and he goes, I got to talk to you. And that was the moment where I'm like, Oh no. And so, so this guy that, um, I bumped from the 84 team comes in and says, well, you didn't make it. And, uh, and, I, and, and just, you know, it just devastated me. And, uh, and so he and I sat down and had a good cry together and, <laughs> Ben described uh, what it felt like for him when I bumped him off the team because I was the young, you know, upcoming, uh, just been a junior uh, racer, and then suddenly I've, I've knocked off somebody who knew he was going to go to the Sarajevo <laughs> Olympics uh, and, and some other guys. Anyway, uh, uh, it, the, one of the things he said was really, really profound and good for me and has followed ever since, and that is, he said it took him a little while to process the fact that he'd identified so much as being an Olympian and a, and a, and a biathlete. And, uh, you know, this guy's a charismatic, good looking guy. And he goes, you know, so I really had to then think, no, I'm, I'm John Ruger and I do biathlon, you know, mm -hmm. but not defined by it. And I thought, no, oh, that's kind of cool. And so that was, that was the, one of those philosophical kind of intersections where I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to be all right, A, but then B, let's just think about this. You know, you have chapters of things that you do. And if you allow yourself to not be defined by them, but engage fully, then, you know, that's kind of a neat way to look at life. 
It's been my over my guiding philosophy. Hence, I've done a whole bunch of crazy stuff. It's all been pretty good. Yeah. So <laughs> you've you've done some amazing things, and uh, you know, same thing with uh, the the SEAL teams. A lot of people have a hard time leaving that community and turning that page oh. and moving moving forward. Um, but uh, that exact advice is something that I that I thought about as well. You know, it's not it doesn't define uh, define who who I am. It's something that I that I do at the time. And now it's something that I did and it's something to continue to build upon as I move forward doing other things. Um, but I think once you can like, articulate that and just process it, it really helps, uh, as you move forward. And especially here in, in park city, I mean, you can't throw a rock without hitting an Olympian around here. And, uh, <laughs> and you see people that uh, have done, you know, cause they're now they start so early and they're, you know, it's their whole entire life. And, and, uh, and then they, they don't make a team or they get injured, uh, and they have to make this transition into something else maybe. Um, so you see it here very similar to what I saw in the SEAL teams as people transitioned uh, into the private sector. Very, very similar. But uh, yeah. man, that 1984 Olympics, I think that it influenced me so much that uh, in this next book I have coming out, In the Blood, it's not Sarajevo, but it's in the, it's in the vicinity um, where, <laughs> where the, uh, the, some of the, the action takes place. And I, I know it, it must have, uh, I must have been drawn towards that area of the world because of those, uh, those 84 Olympics and watching that on, on TV. Um, but then did Dartmouth have a biathlon team back then, or was it, uh, did they have a, a cross country type Nordic team or, or something like that? And then you did biathlon on the side. What was that like? It was the latter. I, I was on the, I was on the ski team there in college, but my, and my, excuse me, my coach had been, uh, on the U S team and gone to the Olympics a couple times in the seventies. And he was just a great guy, you know, much more focused on, on the, the quality of the life of the person that he was tutoring that, than he was upon, you know, the team winning at the NCAAs or whatever. And so he kind of not only, you know, facilitated my, my side gig in biathlon, but really encouraged it. And so there, and, and there were a few, actually a number of people on the team that, that dabbled in both. I mean, you know, uh, our primary duty was to the team itself. Although over the course of my time at Dartmouth, it, it really grew to a place where I was really just trained with the, with the, with the school team. But then in the winter, I, I sometimes would even take the whole winter off from college and go off and ski with the U S team. Wow. So, but, but, the, but Dartmouth was the perfect place for me to be, to do that because it was sort of, you know, the Northeast at the time was much more were the center of biathlon. So the races were not far and we could drive to them. And, and uh, yeah, anyway, wow, that was sort of the time to be involved in the whole thing. Yeah, no, it's such an amazing journey. Uh, also 84. I mean, I remember keeping track of those medal counts. I mean, you had the Soviet <laughs> union there versus us, you know, it was like, uh, I mean, that was a very formative time in my childhood. Um, but I remember <laughs> keeping track of those medal counts, uh, distinctly. Um, but, uh, yeah, what an amazing, I, I, I love growing up what, the, the way I did I and when I did. Kind of fun to think of you as a young man watching that. I, I, uh, that's, that's pretty neat. I, because the truth is, you know, we've covered a lot of ground in life, but if you, you can think back to things like that, as I can too, about the, like, I remember watching my guy from the local hometown in the 76 Olympics and just being inspired by the fact that he was from my hometown. And, um, there he was on TV, you know, yeah. <laughs> it was before stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of fun. Yeah. 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 Our kids are watching, uh, people either they know or that they have heard of through other people from park city here, uh, in the Olympics. Uh, so that's kind of cool to have the, uh, get that hometown type of a family. I wonder how it'll, how it'll influence them going forward. That's a, yeah. that's an interesting, interesting question. Uh, yeah. and then were you always interested in flying? Cause your, cause your dad was a, was a pilot or how did you, and, and how did he, was he in the military? How did he learn how to fly? How did that work for him? That was, he was a, well, he studied forestry in college, and then somewhere, uh, somehow out of that, uh, he joined the Marine Corps and became a Marine Corps helicopter pilot. Oh, wow. And so the, the, the first way for me to describe my entry into, into um, flying is that my father was a Marine. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you've ever watched the movie The Great Santini oh, yeah. but, <laughs> or read the book, but, you know, it took me a long time to understand my dad until I, I either saw that movie or read the book, but I was like, <laughs> He was great. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't going to the ranch or, or flying or, or much of anything, you know, fun for the people in the family. He was, he was great with other people, but the people in the family were just you know, dutifully obeying. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so he had an airplane when I was a, a teenager growing up and he would take me flying once in a while, but he was, he just didn't know how to make it fun. 
and and I hate to say that, but it's true. And and uh, at the same time, it, it also is a window into the fact that I think it's fun, and I always have. I mean, so you'll love though how I how I got into it. It, it had nothing to do with the fact that my dad was a pilot. I was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, and I was I went to college thinking I was going to maybe you know become a doctor, and that was his idea. He's like the guy that always wanted to be a doctor, right? So I like oh, I tried the pre med thing, hated it. Uh, looked at architecture, loved it, hated the guy that was re- le- running the course. So there was this crazy old bastard that was the head of the art department. I was like, no, I'm not going to be around him. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that was the reason I didn't become an architect, you know, which worked out fine. But anyway, uh, while, uh, while doing the sport of biathlon in the U S team, you know, the military has a team and it's, it's mostly populated by guys in the army. And so guys were always trying to talk me to join in the, uh, the, the national guard or the army so that I could be on the, on the national guard team or the army team really wasn't the national guard team. Anyway, uh, they were like, you know, you're, you're doing it anyway. We'll pay you to speed race. And I was like, I'm no way in hell am I joining the army. And, and, uh, <laughs> no. uh, uh, anyway, then somewhere along the way, I met a fellow, uh, from the California air guard and, and he goes, you know, uh, the Boise, uh, the Idaho Air Guard flies F-4s, and you could probably uh, get, a, get a pilot training slot, fly F-4s if you join, and we'll pay you to ski race. And I was like, what? Because, <laughs> you know, Top Gun had just come out, and the thought of flying fighter planes was every young man's dream at that point, including mine. And uh, and so I looked into it, and sure enough, man, I, next time I came back through Boise, I saw these F-4s running, flying up a mission. I was like, that just looks badass, you know? And, and so I joined up, and uh, I, you'll love this though. I, I, uh, when I was sitting down with the recruiter, I was kind of like, I was kind of end running the whole program. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go for this. And I was encouraged to do so by those who wanted to be on the, on the ski team. But I was also like, you know, when you, when you join the guard unit, uh, you can actually just get in as a, if they select you for pilot training and then they'll, they'll send you to commissioning school and all that. But I, I, I figured if I was actually in the unit, I'd have a better shot at getting a pilot training slot because they were pretty selective and pretty hard to get. And so I thought, no, I'll, I'll sign up. I'll just enlist. And uh, and so when you sit down with the recruiters, they're like, well, okay, do you want to go to ejection seat training school? Do you want to be an authority at World Electronics, uh, Avionics? And I'm like, look, this stuff going, no, I really don't want to schedule myself in one of those schools. I want to go to pilot training. And the, and the recruiters looking at me like, yeah, well, good luck. But uh, so I signed, I signed up as a cook because – I was an airman first class. I signed up as a cook because it was the only thing I could sign up on the list that didn't have a technical school involved. In. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's kind of funny. Anyway, I never did flip any burgers in the military. But, but uh, and, and when I sat down with the uh, pilot selection board following that, they, these guys were looking at me, a bunch of fighter pilots, right, sitting across the table from me, and they're looking at me like, they go, so you're in this, you're in the, in this unit. And I'm like, yep. And they're like, and, and you signed up as a cook. And I'm like, yep. And they go, well, what are you going to do if we don't pick you? And I went, well, you better, you got to pick. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm going to cook. <laughs> uh, we were like, okay. You know, that was like, that was like, that was the right, the right you know, sequence of, of, of commentary for them to, to laugh and go, okay, this guy's all right. And, uh, and then they let me in. Wow. That yeah. seems like a very interesting way to go about it. Like, why couldn't you just have uh, applied through like an officer commissioning program for pilots rather than cook in. I, guess, I yeah. I, but I, I just was like eager to get started and eager to make a statement. And, and, and I kind of foresaw that um, I'd have, you know, I don't know, like I said, it's like rushing a fraternity. You know, one of the things is, you know, some generals telling these guys that, 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 that he, they should look closely at this kid that's coming in. They're all really going, Ah, shit. You know, this guy's going to be a douchebag. Uh, <laughs> you got to prove him wrong. Yeah. I had to be myself and, and, and make my own way as part of it. And then also, uh, yeah, by getting on with it, actually, I, I was still trying to pay for college. So, uh, I, I, you know, they started, they, they put me on a page on the payroll to go to ski in Europe for a couple of winters. That wasn't the worst thing. Okay. So you uh, did actually ski for the military and then learn how to fly. Is that how, how that worked? Yeah, for two years I was on the I was on the U.S. Uh, military team. We went, so some great things from that, though. The first is honestly the first time I ever put on a uniform was uh, in Italy, getting ready for the no, I guess France, getting ready for the military world championships. Um, and there was a, another sergeant from the Air Force in the Alaska Guard that was in the unit. He knew how to put Air Force uniforms together. So this guy's showing me where the where you put on your you know your 
your stuff, your U.S. logos and all that stuff. <laughs> so, no, so you didn't have to go to boot camp. You didn't have to go to OCS. You didn't have to do it. It was like a uh, yeah, later to go. Yes, but I avoided. I dodged the whole thing along the way. I just basically for for uh, I, I I put on a uniform for the parade at the military world championships, and then and then we roam around Europe. Uh, you know skiing in various places. But the, the best part of all of that was that uh, there was an event called triathlon in the, in the citizen games, the military world championships games. And it was a combination of biathlon and giant slalom. And, uh, and, and by that time I had some muscles on my body and I was a good Alpine skier. Um, and so I decided I'd do tri uh, triathlon because we basically spent the winters, you know, training for biathlon, but also skiing the big mountains in Europe. Um, and, getting paid to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, it's SISM at the, the games. Um, you'd go up with the, uh, the Alpine team and, and raise, run gates and, uh, run a giant slalom. And then that was somehow combined in a score with the biathlon race. So I remember two things. The first is the highlight of it. It was, I was better than all the guys in the U S on the Alpine team. So I, I was the best Alpine racer that the U S had, um, which, you know, still is astonishing. It just means those other guys weren't that good. <laughs> but in 88, uh, after I missed that Olympic team, I was broken hearted, but went to Europe with the, with the uh, military team. And, uh, and it had a marvelous time. It was the first year that I just kind of relaxed and chased women and drank beer and ate French fries and just enjoyed Europe for what it could be. Right. And, and so I had a blast and, uh, screwed around with, with another friend who was in screw around mode also. And, uh, you know, went off, snuck off to Rome on a weekend when we weren't supposed to and did things like that. But at the, at the but we also performed better than anybody because we were relaxed and we were just focused when we had to be fun. Um, but it, in the giant slalom race, uh, remember Alberto Tamba? Yeah, Tamba yeah. La Bamba? of course. So, uh, he, he was in the gate right in front of me and I'm looking at this big Italian dude going, Oh my God, this is the, you know, this is really something. And so he, uh, he was, he went out the gate in front of me and uh, he, I didn't beat him. He beat me, but, uh, <laughs> The time of La Bamba and uh, it, when he was the king of it all. So that was kind of cool. That is cool. And then, well, then how do you go to uh, OCS or flight school or how does that work? Yeah. After all of that, I mean, basically in, in the unfolding of it, the reason I, I kind of stiff arm the boot camp or the whatever, or, or flipping hamburgers was that soon after I enlisted, I think it was that spring that I went before the pilot selection board. And then they, uh, you know, once you're in that pipeline, you go to uh, National Guard, the National Guard at the time had its own officer training school. Uh, and I went to that, um, which is the same as the Air Force. When it was a bunch of guard guys going through it. And then uh, in those last couple of years, I kind of knew that flight school was on the horizon. And so uh, in right after that winter, of last winter of skiing in 88, I went to Air Force flight school. And, and the way it worked, I, I mean, a lot of people don't understand kind of, especially well, now it's much more transparent. I mean, the, the military is a, blend of guard units and active duty units and guard units have done some crazy things and big things in the wars in the last 20 years. Uh, but when we were doing it, you know, we were actually later one of the first guard units to go, you know, frontline into Iraq, uh, with the F four wild weasel. And, uh, that was really unusual for a guard unit. So it was sort of, I was at a time of, you know, but, but still prior to that, you, you go through air force flight school. Um, and if you, become fighter qualified and make it through, then you can go back to your guard unit and fly fighters. And that was basically what I did. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. But long story, but the, but the main point of that is that in the course of all of that, it, you know, ski racing led me to flying. And then once in, you know, the first time I was there ever, I ever sold an airplane was an air force airplane. And, and, uh, that moment was just the coolest thing. I was like, Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know? And, and just to really, I just really loved that journey. I had a lot of fun and, uh, and was also more mature in a way than a lot of the other people in my, in my class. And so, uh, I, I was really, I've always, by that time I, I was pretty well aware of the need for balance. So I was really good at it, but I also didn't take it too seriously. And, uh, and we had a lot of fun, good camaraderie, the kind of things you, you, you know, you have in the right, those moments in military training where, where, or, military units where wherever they are where where just a lot of good things happen. It was a good it was a good time of life. Yeah. I mean you have the military paying you to ski. You're traveling around Europe. You're having a good time. Don't know how to put on the uniform yet. Uh then then they're paying you to learn how to fly and you love it. Um and what's the progression of aircraft? Like you when you first soloed for the first time, it's in one of those trainer type 
prop plane things and then you move on to jets and what's that progression like? Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the first thing is, it, you know, it's a Cessna 172. Uh, and, it, and then I don't know what they do now, but then it was, it was called uh, flight officer screening program or mm-hmm. something like that. We call it pot. You, go, you went to fish pot in Texas and uh, within four and a half hours, I think in the plane, you solo. So, so it goes, it's really intense and really high speed, you know, for flying 172. And, and they put a lot of pressure on you to try to wash people out of the program before they, you know, spend money on jets on them. So that's, right. that was the whole purpose. I mean, it was just, it was really intense, but really fun. And so 11 hours of flying there, um, during which you've learned how to solo after about five, and then you, you know, learn all these maneuvers and have a check right at the end of it. It's sort of a mini encapsulated version of Air Force Flight School, but that really just gets you over the bridge to go to Air Force Flight School. And then... You know, you're a second lieutenant in the Air Force and show up at, at, at one of the Air Force training bases and there's jets flying around. You look at those things going, wow, I'm going to get to do that, you know, and you get a helmet fitted to your head and, and, and go through all the ground school training for uh, uh, whatever airplane you're going to fly first. And those now they're, they're flying some kind of a turboprop for the base trainer. But, but when I went, they had this really cool little fat wing Cessna jet. It was called the T-37. That's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, and you sit side by side in it, and uh, uh, and it was an aerobatic thing. You could go out and spin it and stuff, and it was and it was uh, really fun to fly. It was one of the ugliest airplanes ever built, ugly as sin. And all the instructor pilots who were assigned to fly T thirty seven squadrons were were a little bit jaded about it because all everybody wanted to be a fighter pilot, right? If they're normal, and and so <laughs> a lot of these guys that you know had the dream of flying fighters and eventually would ended up you know getting stuck in a T thirty seven training squadron, and so. But they were, you know, they just took it as it came and they were all professional. It was a very, very good professional journey. But pretty early on, um, actually, on my first flight in the, in the T-37, they called it the dollar ride. And you're supposed to sit down and, and you, you brief with this instructor and, and they're supposed to do, you know, keep it simple. Don't, don't, don't do anything. They'll get this, this new pilot air sick, you know, and so it's a very gentle, you know, exploratory ride. And I'm sitting down with this guy across the table. He's a young uh, silver, uh, silver bar lieutenant, uh, first lieutenant. And, and I go, you know, I've never been upside down in an airplane. And I'm just, I'm just dying to see what that's like. And he looks at me and he goes, so you want to fuck around? <laughs> and I went, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so we went out and, uh, and, you know, I'd already read the book about all the maneuvers, knew what they were, the spins and the rolls and the loops and the whatever. And, uh, and so he, you know, he just had a little, he saw the spark in my eye and had one of his too. So uh, the very first time in this airplane, I go with this guy and, and he'd do something and then give me the airplane and I do it. And, you know, we start with a roll and then a loop and then a, you know, and by before long, we're spinning the plane. We, we did everything you do in the T-37 on my first flight in it. And the whole way I was like, wow, you know, it's like, yeah. And then we ended up in the, in the, in the uh, traffic pattern and ripping it up and, you know, popping, popping the plane up and kicking the rudder over and just flying it hard. But then, and, and I was, new to flying but i just watched what he did and then did it and the, and the dude was he had so much fun as did i on the, my first flight in the plane that uh he and i tried to fly together as often as we could and the whole journey through flight school wasn't all like that i had a few moments of like oops i screwed <laughs> that up but but uh, but really um it was a it was a whole a year of joy like that and and had a lot of fun with guys flying planes and really and then learning how to do it and getting good at it yeah and you still have that joy. Like you can see on your Instagram. I love that you're posting those, those, uh, videos now. And I, I think your, your yellow plane is now, uh, you're getting a new one, uh, uh, that, that red and white one. And, but you, st- I love those, the, the, the videos that you post, they're incredible. And, uh, at some point I'm, I'm still on the fence as far as I think if I learn how to fly, I think you have to go all in. It's not something you can dabble in, at least from my, from the outside looking in, it looks like something that everything else has to go to the side. You, you have to be focused only on that. That's my perspective. Anyway. Um, it's not something that I'd want, you'd want to just like kind of dabble in on the side or kind of commit yourself to, or, um, I know David Morrell, the guy, the uh, author, amazing guy who created Rambo in 1972 with first blood, uh, incredible guy, but one of his books, he learned how to fly. And, uh, and it became a, you know, a, a, from that point on, um, something that he really enjoyed doing. Um, but when I was a kid, I wanted to learn how to do it so that I could fly an F4U Corsair. Cause that's what my grandfather flew in world war II. Uh, he was killed yeah. off Okinawa in 1945, but I grew up with the, making the model planes and with his medals and pictures of his squadron. And of course, Black Sheep Squadron's on TV with Robert Conrad at the time. So, uh, so I've always wanted to learn how to fly just 
so I could do that. And then watching your Instagram, I'm like, oh man, look at that flying through the mountains. And then I, I watch a little while longer and I think I should only do this with Glenn is him flying and me <laughs> just sitting there. Uh, like I probably don't need to be doing this on my own. But Glenn is also a little bit of a cowboy at times. So you need to, you need to remember that. Part. But, uh, <laughs> but here I am, you know, the, the good, you probably should do it with me because I'll tell you one, one of my, the mysteries of my life is that for some reason, God keeps me alive. You know, I, there's really, uh, no explanation for that. At this point, I, I look at it, I'm like, wow, I, I can't believe it. But, you know, here I am, still have everything. Um, but anyway, I, I, I do two things. I guess the first is to go back to what you said. It is something you can do on the side, but you need, you need to do it consistently. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, it's not going to be something that's, you know, your defining thing. But, uh, but boy, absolutely a pursuit. Everybody that ever says, I want to learn how to fly, I go, you should do it. Because um, it opens up. First of all, the three-dimensional world world of air around us. You know, you're no longer confined anything else. You go up, you go down, you go around things, and you mean, it's a really, you know, creative and fun way to get places. Um, but also just beautiful, and that just the freedom of flight is is wonderful. And uh, and then uh, you know, once you once you become a private pilot in the, in the United States, it's just a blast. I mean, you can get in your, you know, oh, that's a, like a, you know, I flew that thing out to the East Coast recently, and that, it, the whole you know process of going across the country in an airplane where you go, well, I've got my, you know, my gas is this much and I, you know, it's this far to a, a, a gas station basically. And like, Oh, you know, wh- which one it, it's just fun to, you know, to, to be flexible and go, well, the weather's okay over there. I'll go that way. Yeah. And, uh, it's to land and get gas. And it's, it's a lot of, and then, uh, you know, I've, I've been flying these, uh, these big de Havilland beavers and love it, man. It's the coolest airplane mm. because it, because it's, field you know take off and landing airplane so you can go into you know bush strips but you can also load it up with camping gear or you know building materials for going back mm-hmm. to the ranch or whatever and uh and they're just big you know cool you know badass airplanes so i really like that uh they've been around for a while but, yeah yeah they're old but they're good yeah no, that's i love though i love when i go uh get flown into a backcountry uh area and you know those types of aircraft and i'm always just uh every time i come back i start re- researching on the internet and looking at the different models and the different years and different things you can do with them with uh tundra tires and with skis and and uh, uh pontoons the whole the whole thing i just i just love love all that that versatility um but uh what, what, and I was following your journey across the country too. That was so cool. You went to Winter Strong um, with Bert out there and uh, at, at Sornex, and that was so cool to see you do that. I couldn't make it this year because I'm juggling the books and all the rest of it. But uh, uh, that was so cool to see you make that journey. Um, yeah. And what what air what airframes did you fly in the Air Force then? What what were your? Uh... Well, the first was the F four. Flew a couple of versions of that, and uh, you know, when you say F four, is orange. that the F four Phantom or is that a different? Wow. Yeah, the fan. That's so cool. Yeah. That is a great, cool looking aircraft. That's one of the first models I made as a kid. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so me too. So, uh, here, that's cool. since, since we get, since I can move, so nice. this is my model. Oh, there it is. I mean, I made that one in, in flight school, and then I this is it also in flight school. I drew that. You drew that? Yeah, I drew that. What? Yeah. I, mean, I know. I know where you can get a print of it if you Dang, want one. That's amazing. <laughs> that is incredible that you did that. Jeez. So you start off in that, that airframe and then, uh, and then what do you graduate or do you graduate or do you shift laterally or how does that work? What are you, what else are you flying? Again, if you're in the regular air force and you reassign to different places and they move around the world. And a lot of people don't know, again, the difference in that typical air force, you know, careers involve assignments to non-flying jobs where in the guard, that the best thing about the guard is you got to fly a lot, mm. you know, especially if you're young and unattached as I was. I flew the heck out of out of the F four. Got a couple thousand hours in that thing to, in the nineties. And the first version was this one. It was a the, the RF four reconnaissance version. So it's filled with cameras. And I look I look now. You know, then I was a young man. Going, God, I wish we had guns. You know, and and uh, um, or could drop bombs. All that stuff seems so cool. But taking pictures with an airplane is actually pretty remarkable. And I I, I look back now at it now, and I really kind of wish I could redo that that short chapter because. Um, you know, and I, I don't really have any good pictures I took with the airplane and I had these great cameras. I actually said, but, uh, but that didn't last that long. And, uh, in our squadron at, uh, after the end of the first Gulf war, or not really the end, but sort of the, the tapering of it and, and, and going into the in-between years, uh, the air force was moving out of the, the, this mission called the wild weasel and the weasel went back to Vietnam 
Uh, it's basically uh, a platform to to seek and destroy enemy surface air radar sites. And uh, and so the Air Force culture for the wild weasel community was really tight, and they were really jaded about the fact that they were going to maybe give this up to the Toon Air Guard unit. Um, I guess this was 1991 and two that we transitioned from the recce version to the to the weasel mission. But we took it on proudly, man. And and uh, the the weasel motto was uh, was YTBSM, which stands for "You Got to Be Shitting Me." Because legend has it that the first time that anybody told the fighter pilot this is what he was going to go do, this this is how you get this missile off the rail of your airplane, shoot, shooting at this SA two site in Vietnam. The guys were like, "You got to be shitting me." Wow. Anyway, the. the you know, the history of that mission and that culture, when we got into it, went right back to Vietnam. You know, the bloodline was there. And a lot of the guys that came into our squadron with the mission um, had been old weasel guys uh, from either Vietnam or from that, that, that time immediately after the, the, the bridge to the early 90s. And so uh, as soon as we picked it up, we were we we it was a tier one mission at the time. And we basically were the first guard unit with those kinds of airframes to sign up to go to the Middle East. So we went to and from either Turkey or Dharan, Saudi Arabia, and flew it into either northern or southern Iraq. And I'm one of the few guys that, you know, that actually got a chance to shoot a harm off the thing one night. That was, that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, but it was just, it was really one of the best, you know, things I've ever done to, to, to know that you're a meaningful part of a package of airplanes going into hostile territory and, and to be the first guys over the fence. It was just cool. Uh, wow. And the last, you know, yeah. And so that, so that's a, the first Gulf War. So you deploy, uh, for purpose for that, that conflict. And that's the airframe that you flew throughout that, uh, yeah. in the first Gulf War. I, I, the weasels in the main Gulf War, the first Gulf War, you know, in, during the first invasion under Storm and Norman, those guys had a wild, wild fight. I mean, there, there was a, you know, the Iraqi air defense system was, uh, was pretty robust and, and there was a, it was rock and roll, uh, you know, missiles flying off both off the ground and, and from the air to the ground. Um, we went in after the really hot part. So we were trying, we were, we were like, you know, vibrating with, you know, we want to go, we want to go, we want to go. By the time we got there, it was sort of quieted down, but still, um, you know, Saddam Hussein's Iraq was under us for, for a lot of years uh, through that. And uh, uh, it was, but it was quieter. You know, we, we, we watched a lot of warfare. We didn't get to participate that often. It was just that time when, uh, but it was still, it was, it was pretty cool to be there. Uh, uh, yeah. And then, uh, at, at some point in that, one of the funny things about that, I'll just say it is, uh, the F4 was a great platform for that mission because it's, a, it's this big, hard, fast, stiff airplane. It was rigid. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the receptors that were on the wingtips and the tail and the nose, uh, didn't actually, I shouldn't say wingtips. It was on the, the main ones are on the, on the both sides of the nose and the tail and the airplane was very stiff. So, um, the, the antennas, the phase array antennas that it had didn't move in relation to each other. So it was really good at receiving signals from whatever. And, uh, and then pinpointing where that radar was coming from and handing the, the, the information off to the harm missile mm -hmm. or in the case of air to air fighting, we were flying these 1969 model F4s and we'd go out, you know, in uh, dissimilar air combat against F-16s or F-15s or whatever in our training. And we did pretty well nice. because we had, we had this, a better raw system than they had. And so we knew exactly when to go into the, uh, uh, it was called the Doppler notch, but we'd go 90 degrees to the approaching radar of this, these Doppler radars and basically disappear from their screens. We'd shut everything off and we'd sneak down high or sneak up low and roll in behind them as they came around and, shoot them and it was always just so much fun to, to be like yeah you know <laughs> these, these crazy crazy badasses in the f4s uh yeah, it was pretty that was a pretty good a lot of fun doing that um uh, so then uh somewhere along the way though the air force decided that they couldn't have these old airplanes flying anymore so they put them away shot them down as drones and uh and they replaced our mission with uh with the a10 and and so in the mid 90s i transitioned to the warthog and uh, that was pretty cool. Everybody, it's funny. I, people ask what I flew, and I go, "Yeah, I flew the F four and the A ten. Everybody goes, "Oh God, the A ten! Yeah. I handle handle a lot, ran a lot of army and uh, uh, Marine guys now, I guess, and, and guys like you that, that that really have a lot of respect for the A oh, ten. Yes. And uh, and that it, and that was cool. I was a I was a air fac, a forward air controller, uh, 
so I went off by myself in that airplane a lot to, you know, to work with guys on the ground. It was really my first time where I became aware of the ground mission because in the, in the weasel uh, and the F4, you know, the RF4 was technically, you know, we're getting, we're getting fragged by army commanders to get pictures of something, but it was all theoretical. We never actually did it in, in war in my squadron, but in the A-10, uh, you know, you really realize that, oh yeah, there's like a, you know, ground battle going on down there and we're going to go help the good guys. And, and uh, that was pretty, that was a good uh, lead into what came later in that I, you know, it really kind of tuned me into battlefield uh, structure and objectives and all that stuff, but also, you know, the air forward air controller and, and bomb droppers role in that, the close air support mission, all that stuff. Um, and so then uh, the, I'll tell you just two quick things about the A-10. The, the first time, you know, transitioning out of the F-4, which was this like firm, fast, you know, the, one of the fastest fighters ever built, right? One of the true Mach 2 fighters. Uh, the A-10 was uh, very different. And uh, you know, the F-4 was just jam-packed full of hydraulics and engines and fuel lines and stuff, wires going everywhere. The A-10, you, you know, is like a Cessna. You could open up a panel, stick your head up there and see a hole all the way back to there. So it was like this, a weird airplane. And then uh, also, though, you know, built built for what it does. It was a great, uh, it's it was a, it's great at the close air support mission part because it goes half the speed of other fighters. Mm -hmm. So you, you, know, you can a tighter space and see things better. Um, but the first time I ever got in and flew it, there wasn't a simulator. So they teach you how to fly. You learn all the stuff and then you go out there and you get in and you start it up and you go fly. What? And yeah, that, which was, which was very different. Um, but again, it's the kind of airplane where you can do that. It's not, you know, not like you have to do it right. Uh, and most people, most people get through that, but, um, uh, taxing out of the chalks, you do, you do a bake, a brake check to, you know, you basically push the throttle up and then, and then, and then the airplane starts to roll and you tap the brakes to make sure they're working. And so I remember that moment where I, you know, okay, I started the thing up, it's running, you know, flight lead's going to go out, the instructor's going to go out. And so I, you know, I tell the guy to pull the chocks and we go, and I do my brake check, check and this airplane kind of feels like it goes, boing, wow. you know, it's like, that. what the heck? Okay. <laughs> With bungee cords. And so just such a different, you know, feeling plane that I'd ever flown to that point. But then, uh, but then, you know, you figure it all out and you, you bond with it in its way. And, and it was a blast. And then of course that the, the great evolution in it is, uh, is the gun. I mean, everybody goes, Oh man, you flew like shooting that gun. And you go, yeah, it is pretty impressive. I mean, that, the, the Gowie, uh, out of an A-10 is an impressive thing to fire off. And you can, you know, sometimes see that the spiral of bullets, the shock wave going through the air in front of you and then watch the, as it hit whatever you're shooting at. And well, first of all, just the roar of the cannon as you, as you light it off underneath you, it's like, holy crap, you know, that's impressive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Smoke coming up, the whole airplane shaking. And, <sighs> oh, yeah. So. That sound, you never forget it. And uh, it's one you want to hear if you're in uh, in close contact with the enemy and you're calling in air support. Um, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I, I went to, to the, what is it called? FAC A school, is that right? In Fallon, Nevada? I forget. I'll have to look at my side. I've done that twice. Uh, so I've gotten to work with the, the A-10s quite a bit over the years. And I have a flag around cool. here somewhere that uh, an A-10 took up for me in Afghanistan. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, they were flying the, the flags on missions, you know, and get a little uh, certificate who, who flew it for you and, and all that sort of a thing. Uh, brought it back for some, awesome. some family members. But that A-10, that is a, such a great air, airframe, uh, such an incredible yep. platform. And then you always hear about that they're going to uh, decommission them or retire them or that sort of thing. And I think they, they were doing it and then they weren't. And then I'm not sure where it stands these days, but there's nothing else like that thing. I don't know why we would right. ever, uh, unless you're replacing it with something better. Like, why would you get rid of that thing? Uh, if you've been on the ground, uh, you, you're anybody who's a politician or in charge of, uh, you know, military budgets and, uh, allocations and all the rest of it. If you have, uh, ha have been on the ground and had one of those things fly for you, you're not going to want to vote to get rid of that thing. Uh, there's no way yeah. <laughs> I, I can't see anybody ever say, yeah, let's just, we're not going to need those again. Let's just decommission those thing, mothball them. what, no way. Um, do yeah. you know the status of those right now? I think it's, uh, it's not going to go away. I mean, every, re everybody realizes that there's just, that, that it's really an, an essential component to the kind of warfare we're likely to encounter now, even if it's against a major power, you still want those things. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, they're, and then they've also become more capable since I flew them, the things that, you know, they have, they have some really impressive, uh, you know, a, attack related, uh, uh, capabilities now that are, that are first 
tier. And so, yeah, I'm sure they're going to, they're going to be around for a while. Good. It's sort of like that fever now it's, it's, it's a barren plane that has no, no peer, no like, mm-hmm. no, and no equal. And so, uh, you know, people just keep rebuilding them and then the daytime will be the same. It, it's, it's probably going to be in the, in the inventory for a while. That's so cool. That you got to, you got to experience that and do that. Um, and then also uh, have that connection with the person on the ground, which eventually leads you to get into back making backpacks. Like, how does this work? How does this, uh, are you hunting the whole time that you're in the military? Is that, has it always been a part of your life or something you come back to? And then where do you think, come up with, Hey, you know what? I'm going to combine. I used to go carry this rifle on my back when I was doing biathlon. Um, I was, I've been flying, I've been clo- close air support for these guys on the ground. You know what? I'm going to make a backpack that, uh, is kind of built around the idea of being able to carry a rifle more efficiently. Um, how does this, how does this come about? Well, that, that, that started with hunting. I, you know, I, yes, to answer your question, I, while flying in the military, I'd, I'd hunt when I could in the fall and, uh, and I'd go into the back country of Idaho, um, and was used to carrying a rifle on my back. That idea is, you know, you're so much more efficient when your hands are free and when this, when the heavy thing you're carrying is, is in your, near your spine. And so having that sort of whole history in my head when I'm out climbing around with a rifle on a sling and everybody knows that at some point that's just awkward or you wish you had another, you know, after, after several days of it, you're like, oh, can't find a tire of this um, or whatever. But um, the other thing is just, you know, for the agility and, and the ability to use your hands for something else neatly, but to get the rifle, get, get at the rifle quickly and easily when you want it. That was sort of the, you know, the, the hallmark kind of feel that I had in my mind's eye for what we, what I wish I had. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd been involved in that biathlon rifle design project. And so when doing that, I was thinking about, you know, the fact that there were, that, that there was this whole hunting industry that really didn't have performance related gear. And I, I had guys in the eighties uh, asking me to make right, uh, stocks for their hunting rifles to make them lighter. And I was like, well, I, it's really not, you know, you can't make put up, you know, the biathlon rifle doesn't translate to a hunting rifle, but I thought about, you know, what you could do. And so actually 1987, I took a, an industrial design course, my last term at, at Dartmouth. And, uh, in that course, I drew my first pack, uh, because I had in my mind's eye, this gear company that would, you know, that would be much more than just rifle stocks. And, uh, and then, uh, I also in that course built two hunting rifles that were you know, carbon fiber, wood, laminate, lightweight hunting rifles that are still very unique. Wow. Um, and yeah, anyway, uh, did that in college and, and then had that in my head all through the nineties while I was flying in the military, uh, uh, built my first actual hunting packs in the parachute shop at the air guard, uh, with, with people who could sew and, uh, um, and I'd been testing them, the, the concept. And, and, and so the concept became, well, gosh, you know, I want, I want a compact below the shoulders, you know, tactical style, uh, pack for, that'll be out of my way when I'm hunting, but uh, I need to be able to put a rifle in it. So I, that was where the scabbard came in. And it needs to be close to my body because the heaviest thing in my pack is going to be this gun. And, 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 and also I can reach it and pull it out of the scabbard if it's there. I, I, I was the first guy to, not the first guy to think of it. I've had other people go, oh yeah, I thought of that. Well, you never did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I did it. And then I thought also about, you know, how would you make a pack that you could deploy from this compact day pack thing to a big enough pack to carry elk porters out from the middle of nowhere to save that whole first trip out to get a pack and come back that most people were doing back in those days. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I pioneered the concept, uh, in the nineties and through the late nineties, uh, I was going, I'd go into a sporting goods store and go, Oh man, I, I, you know, I'd always be surprised that nobody had done it yet. And every, I, every year I'd be like, shit, <laughs> these good hunting packs. And so, uh, I, I kind of had the whole thing constructed in my head and, and with, that pulling at me and, and sort of the, the, I love flying fighters, you know, and, and honestly, if the, if my unit still had F4s, I'd probably still be doing it. <laughs> but uh, the A-10 was a, was one of those things that while doing it, the whole thing really, I, I was like, okay, this is it was, go back to that thing that John Ruger told me about being a biathlete, but not letting him, it define him. I love being a fighter pilot, but I also knew that it was a chapter of life that would end appropriately and it would end one way or another. If I, if I took it too far and was one of the approaching 60 year old guys that had never given it up, um, I'd probably regret, mm. you know, the one dimensionality of my life at that point, I figured. So I saw, I foresaw that and decided on my own terms to leave, uh, the military 
became an airline pilot and uh, was flying United Airlines on September 11th when I went, oh, shit, my life just changed that, that morning and uh, really felt the vulnerability of the, of the company and, 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 and of, of the paycheck that was putting food on the table and paying the mortgage. And uh, so that day, basically decided to start this company that was in my head. And uh, uh, over the course of the next weeks, kind of processed what, you know, what it would be and how, what, I, what I would call it. I, I was aware of the whole notion of a brand. And so I was like, okay, um, you know, you got to, got to build a brand. How do you do that? <laughs> and uh, I had the Eberly stock company was a rifle stock company that had been on my tax return every year since 1985. And uh, I decided, you know, in the course of exploring names for a company that I combined those two words, Eberly stock. And it was the only thing that Googled if you did it. So I was like, okay, that'll work. And then nobody could say it, but I always, I was like, oh, they'll, they'll figure it out. <laughs> now look, you've got the hat I on. do. I got the hat, <laughs> got this. I have about six packs. Um, that's incredible. What, and where were you on September 11th? Then were you actually, were you flying that day? Or what was, what was, what happened? And, and my wife, uh, my ex-wife uh, now uh, woke me up and said, Hey, you know, this, something happened, an airplane or, or she, she said, some airplanes flew into the world trade center. And I was sitting there going, did you say airplanes? What? And I was, I was thinking, was it a formation flight? You know, how, what, what kind of a jackass thing is that? And so I turned on the TV and when I saw what had happened, I, I was so profoundly impacted by the monstrosity of it um, that I was just furious. I couldn't believe, and I still can't, that somebody could do something like that, um, weaponize something like a commercial airliner and do that with innocence inside the airplane, but also to add to the innocence inside the buildings that they were attacking. The whole thing just, it still just makes you realize, man, that is, if nothing else, the face of evil. And you should look at it with open eyes and know that that is something to fight. And, uh, and really that day, I just, I, my, I wrote the letter uh, back to the general that was, that had always told me I'd be the general someday in our guardian if I stuck around that I was like, okay, I want to come back. <laughs> and, and, you know, I had this letter that I, I was like, we're going to, we're going to go to war. We're going to drop bombs on people. And I want to do it was, was my first impulse. And then um, I never sent the letter because I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought, you know, I have this gear company in my head. Um, I owe it to myself and really to my family. And, uh, you know, I, I made this sort of the strategic decision at that time to not go back once again to flying fighter planes, but to, to, tr to, to launch this company that I'd been mentally constructing. And, uh, and so I'd had a, you know, a, 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 I've told the story before and I, it's, I'm not, not to you or your audience. I'll just say it again. But, um, when I was a kid, I played little league, league baseball and I sucked at it, but my, uh, my coach, later in life became the president of the North face. And so I always looked at the North face as sort of this brand model for, you know, the kind of company that could be built in the, in the hunting sphere. And at the time I was really focused on, on hunting and shooting sports. Um, and so I, I basically in the course of trying to figure out how to make this commercial commercialize this pack idea I'd had, I called up my ex baseball coach and I asked him where in China do I go to make this thing? I figured I would. And he goes, don't go to China. And he basically then explained to me that, you know, where the, the, the gene pool and the best places in the world are to make, uh, you know, high quality backpacks. And I was, you know, that led me to, you know, into the ex exploration, how you get there. And I, uh, he referred me to some people that could help me with the design process initially. And so my first kind of, um, uh, engagement with, with that process of working, toward a commercial product was through some ex uh, ex north face people that had gone on to form a, a, a design and and, and uh, uh, sourcing firm uh, so they anyway led me into the, over the next few years by 2003 I had a my first hunting pack and a commercial product that we made um, and uh, uh, named it the just one pack because I only had one but also I was like if you're gonna just one hunting pack this is one to own and, and that concept had that rifle scabbard that you could pull the rifle out and, uh, and uh, compression straps that could grapple things to it or that same expansion thing that could open up and, and you could stick an L quarter into. And, and, and so great um, concept and really a, a commercial success right away. But I also learned a lot from that first round, uh, how to make backpacks. And, and so really from then forward, worked on making them so that they wouldn't break when you stuck L quarters in them. And, uh, and, 
you know, demanded ever higher quality standards and ever, you know, better materials. And, you know, uh, and, and, and every step of the journey since then has been always working towards improving the concept, improving the product, trying something else that's not done yet, trying a new goal that is in our line or elsewhere in the marketplace. And uh, anyway, that, that's how this started. Uh, the second year into it, I, I had a guy here in the Boise market, I, you know, I didn't have many dealers, so I'd go scrap around and find one when I could and walk in this little shop over the hill in Emmett. And this old fella, you know, goes, well, I really don't want to buy your packs, but, uh, but you should make one that's big enough to hold an, an AR. And then I was like, why? And he goes, well, my, my kid does this sport called three gun. And, and if you, uh, you know, they really need better ways to move their stuff around. So I thought, well, that's, I'd been thinking about anyway, a different format. And so the second year into the thing, I made a, uh, a narrower pack with a wider throat that had a big enough scabbard in it to put into whatever turned out to be tactical weapons or whatever. And uh, I called that one, the gunslinger. Yeah, and I have it. I have one, uh, one of the iterations of it anyway. And you probably a couple down the road, uh, by the, by, by Oh five, you know, just a few years down the road. Now I was making packs that were really good, really robust. And many of them are probably still out there, but they still with an eye on the commercial market, uh, and some guy had taken some of those to uh, shooting competition where some guys from third special forces group mm. were there and they saw that thing and they were blown away by it, which I later found out. I was, I, it's always, it always amazed me. And, uh, and they ordered like 30 of them. And this, this guy called me up and he goes, I just got to tell you that I can wear any pair of boots I want. I can shoot any gun I want. Your pack is the best thing to come our way in 30 years. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you know, we really don't have an, a way to carry, you know, uh, our primary weapon and our secondary weapon and all this crap and your thing does it. And I was like, just astonished that, that, um, the U S military by that point had not, you know, especially the special forces guys didn't have all of that shit all figured mm-hmm. out. So, um, that, maybe just kind of stop and look. And that was where I was like, wow, this, you know, I could actually make a difference. And, and then as the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq really heated up, uh, that was just a great journey for me, you know, working with guys, you know, your counterparts or whoever that, that needed a solution for carrying, you know, all the weaponry that they were carrying as well as the ammo and the self-sustainment stuff and all of that in an organized fashion. And I, I was never, uh, you know, a sniper, uh, but I've trained with them a bit and seen how they work. And, you know, just the simple, com- uh, concepts of organization and intuitive, you know, finding of things, uh, and, and then, you know, the ability to, to, to carry a load in the right place quietly and to carry weapons and get at them easily, all of that stuff just sort of came naturally, but also, you know, one step at a time. Uh, and, and so, uh, as it turned out, you know, I, I looked back at the whole thing and I've been really glad I didn't send that letter to rejoin the A-10 unit <laughs> because, uh, you know, there was a time period, especially in Iraq, when, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's, it was rumored that the uh, Chechens had come down and these Chechen snipers were killing Americans. Uh, and of course, if, if there was a platoon of Marines walking down the road, uh, the sniper would have a scoped rifle slung around his, his shoulders. And, and he was the guy that the Chechen snipers would shoot. So American snipers were getting shot, you know, selectively more often than anybody else. And, uh, and so then when they started going to war with Everly stock packs on their back and this rifle was stuck away with a cap over it, there was about a year and a half when the guys weren't getting shot, at, you know, any more than anybody else. And, and, uh, and I'd have, you know, for me to hear guys come back from war going, Oh man, you're saving lives. This is what's going on. I was like, did you just say I'm saving lives? <laughs> it was such a cool thing to realize that I'd made a difference. But then also, I think, I think I, I you know, I haven't done all the work that's been done in that whole field, but I definitely know that, I, that it's a little bit like biop. I'm in a different format of that. And that I, I really did do things that changed the arc of, of how Americans go to war and, and really allies all, all over the world. I mean, a lot of American, like I think some of the SEAL teams first found our stuff because they went to Afghanistan and saw these Norwegians mm-hmm. with packs with rifles sticking out of them. These guys are going up mountains and they go, yeah, this is the way to do it. And, uh, 
anyway, that, that sort of cross pollination of, of our, our allies and our, and our own guys uh, was, was a lot of what sort of built that back backside of our brand. And, uh, but it's just always been, it gives me joy, first of all, to have learned uh, that in our community, the, in the special ops guys and the snipers and those guys, are the, and the seals are the smart ones and, and, and in the bunch. And so it's fun to work with them. It's been really, uh, really cool. And also really cool to know that, you know, that we've actually done something meaning, meaningful in the whole plan. Oh, I mean, what a journey. Uh, I think my, I think I have the, yeah. what the gunslinger two might be the one that I, that I have. Um, but, yeah. uh, I'm trying to remember where I first, ex- where I first, re- uh, became aware of you or the packs. And I think it might be through Clinton Heidi Smith at Thunder Ranch. I think they had, they told me about these packs. I think, I, I can't remember. Now I have so many of them and I've been a backpack guy my whole life. So uh, backpacking with my parents in, in Northern California with the old, you know, old school 1980s external frame Kelties, you know, I hope yep. my mom still has my original in the, in the attic somewhere. Cause it'd be really cool uh, to line them all up. I have most of uh, this, you know, from let's say 1983 onward, I have like the, iter- the whole museum of, uh, of packs from a, a variety of, of different companies. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I have, I have a bunch of yours and, uh, and I love them and I love the story behind it. And, uh, um, it's it just, a, just incredible what you've, what you've done, what you've created. Um, and I put it in the first video I made. So I had a, this homemade video for my first book, a book trailer. It's on my website still. And I have this no, no shoes on and I have your pack on my back and my rifle in it. And I'm out here behind the house and I'm going through the snow as part of this, uh, you know, book trailer video as, uh, as I launched the f- first book, The Terminal List. And, and now it's in the series. So you got to keep your eyes uh, open. And uh, when the series comes out July 1st, all eight episodes, I think are dropping at once. Um, but, uh, but there's a, a scene in there where you could definitely know it's an Everly stock pack. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm incredibly honored that that would be the case. That's really fun. I'm, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah. Super cool. And then, uh, uh, those stocks, those first stocks, did, did you, did you have, did you, how many did you sell or not? How many did you sell? Was it a business for a while? And then you just took a pause and then turned it into packs or was there overlap there at a certain time or what happened there? Well, really, I mean, looking back, it's, it's interesting. I, I had, some form of income from it every year from 85 through 03, I was, I was making rifle stocks of one kind or another, you know, not often, you know, it might be three or four a year. Uh, and sometimes obviously a lot more than that. I mean, I, I did have a little cottage industry business in the in late eighties, early nineties, making, uh, you know, rifle stocks for biathlon, but that was never going to be big business. Uh, the hunting rifle side, I've, I've made a handful through the years. Um, I still, you know, have the urge to go explore some of those concepts because I still have some of the, you know, the ergonomic uh, insights that I have, as well as the, you know, the, you know, what works in a lightweight rifle and what doesn't. I still think I have some ideas that are better than what anybody's done. Um, I just have to do it or, or, or commercialize it or, or not, <laughs> but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm tempted to do it uh, and, and may play with it again in the future. We'll see. Well, it looks like you're having a blast. I mean, I love following you on the social channels. Um, let's see what you're doing out there in the back country. Uh, love to see what the company's doing, how it's growing. Uh, everybody you have on the team has just been fantastic. Um, what a, what a great crew that, uh, that you have assembled and, man, do you think you should, I, well, I don't know. I, I'm going to tell you, I think you should write all this down one day, uh, and, and write know. a book about this whole thing. I mean, incredible the way you grew up. I mean, you have some crazy family stories. It sounds like with the great Santini there. Uh, and then you're a biathlete when people don't really know in America, we what this thing is. And then you're going to the Olympics in Sarajevo and you're going to Dartmouth and you're going in there and you're building rifle stocks at Dartmouth of all places. Uh, then you're joining the air force and you're flying these different airframes. And then you're, uh, I mean, you're starting this company and I mean, it's an amazing story. So I do hope that one day that you do, uh, put pen to paper and, uh, and write this down. Cause it's certainly an inspirational journey, not just for veterans, but for, uh, for anybody, for any, any American that, uh, cause I mean, we still have the, uh, a country that offers us the options and opportunities, um, that, uh, that previous generations gave us by putting their lives on the line and, and in many cases paying the ultimate price. And, um, and we can still make choices today based on free will and, uh, and yeah. create the life that we want. So uh, I think it's an incredibly inspirational journey. And I hope, uh, uh, 
by writing a book and more people could, could see that and, uh, and realize, Hey, you know what? I can, I can make the life I want to. I, I appreciate the, the, uh, encouragement to do that. I've, of course, I've had the temptation. Um, I am a reader, um, and I can write when I choose to do so. I just, uh, I just need to slow down enough to, to start doing that because it's funny, you know, over a campfire with a glass of whiskey, uh, some of the more colorful stories start to come out. And I, and I, I know from the laughter that I've generated that I actually have some unique um, life experiences that people want to know about, but, but I do, and I do need to stop and do that. I've, I have a couple books actually. So uh, if you run across uh, an author called Mark Halperin, that sounds familiar, but I can't, I uh, can't place it. It's similar to Halperin, I think, but Halperin is with you know, Swollen E and he, uh, he's wrote, he's written some books. I didn't like so much, but he wrote two. But if you haven't read, I'm going to send to you. But um, and one of them is called A Soldier of the Great War. And, and the other one is called Memoir from Ant, Ant Proof Case. Uh, and the latter, uh, I'll get, I'll send it to you. Anyway, um, Ant Proof Case, uh, as you'll discover, is, is both of the books are sort of interesting in that he's good at, at, the, at, at telling a story, um, intersecting, you know, future and past events and sort of talk, and, and current, you know, so basically blending this together, not, um, not in a linear fashion. And he actually says it in Ant Proof Case that, um, you know, I'm going to tell the story the way it comes to you when you think, you know, you, you, you have a recollection of something in the past and then, and then you talk about it. And so the guy, first of all, is, is an amazing wordsmith and master of the English language. The way that he puts things together is just, you sometimes I'll read a paragraph and go, whoa. And, 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 and to tell you, I've read a lot of books, love, love to do so, but Ant Proof Case was the first book I ever read. I think it was on a trip overseas someplace. To, and I, first book I ever, I ever read, though, and I got to the last page and was like, whoa. And I went back to the first and read it again. Because um, it was just that kind of story. And, and, and it's one that I still pick up. Not because it's the best book ever. It has some, you know, some improbable parts and whatever. But I love the way the guy writes. And I love his insights into humanity and you know, issues that matters of the heart, as well as just sort of colorful, fun stuff. But I also love the way he tells a story and that it, it's always been my goal to tell a story that way that, you know, someday it's the old man looking back at his life. And, and, and as it comes to you, you, you know, intersect one thing to the next and weave a story and great. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll make a point to get you a couple copies of those. Oh, thank you. It'll be my. I sincerely yeah. appreciate that. And I hope that we can link up uh, again in person and uh, share a whiskey around a fire or get in the back country together or uh, go for a head up in the, in the, the aircraft and, uh, and fly through the mountains. Like I see on your Instagram. Um, I mean, yeah. amazing, amazing. I love, and the, the one where you land in the desert and you're camping out there. I mean, and then you're, yeah, falling in some river in the snow and the whole thing, like you got a lot going on and it is just, uh, it's, it's just awesome that we can, uh, kind of follow each other's journeys on the, on the social channels these days uh, with all the negative stuff that it does bring as well. But it's very cool that we can, can share those, uh, those type of experiences and, and I can follow along and see what you're doing. Well, uh, it cheers me and it, and, it, and, it, and it gives me honor that you might be interested at in all. I, I, uh, I realized along the way though, that I also like looking at what other people are doing. It's funny. You go, Oh yeah, look at that. And, and, and yet, you know, definitely there's no question. My whole, my whole trajectory in life has been a lot different than other people's and, and still is. So, and, and, but as you said, I, I'm having a blast. Nice. It looks I, like, uh, it looks like you're still having a great time with it. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's inspiring as well. So, um, uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for, coming on and taking this time. And, um, and I sincerely appreciate it and really hope that we can, can link up in person soon. Let's do it. I'm, I'm, you all, you have an open invitation here anytime. Thank you. And we got to get on the skis too. Well, first I got to get back in shape. Then I got to get on skis and then I got to get that rifle. And, uh, and I'd love to go around the, the track a couple of times with you and, uh, and do that. You're supposed to be winded when you come into shoot in biathlon. That's that's the whole point of it. So you don't don't. don't, don't. <laughs> well, that part I think I can do. I, I I can at least be winded when I show up uh, at the shooting stage. So uh, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you again for doing this, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can link up soon. Look forward to awesome. it. All right, take All right. care, Glenn. Navy Federal Credit Union. The name would suggest that it is just for members of the Navy, but that's not true. It is open to all members of the military, regardless of branch, veterans and their families. So go to NavyFederal.org, check them out. 
federally insured by NCUA. They have uh, certainly financed a few of my motorcycles over the years. I've been a member since 1996. So uh, car loans, home loans, motorcycle loans, whatever it might be, be sure to check them out. And if you're just getting started and need some help investing, they can help you there too. So be sure and check out NavyFederal.org. Today's gear segment is sponsored by Zero Foxtrot. Check them out at zerofoxtrot.com. And I'm so excited for this because I've been a fan of these guys for a long time uh, since I became aware of who they were uh, three or four years ago. And if you go back to pictures of my last office, you can zoom in and just behind my right shoulder will be this cup, although it's in a different color. Drink coffee, stack bodies. Yeah, I love what these guys do. Ton of vintage military inspired products, Zippos, beer steins, coffee mugs, whiskey glasses, shot glasses, shirts, hats, uh, all that sort of thing. But if you're not following them on Instagram, you definitely need to do that. So that's Zulu Fux, Z U L U F U C X S. But great, uh, great Instagram uh, page, incredible stuff there. But if you go to zerofoxtrot.com and check them out. Order a few products. Use code JC at checkout for 20% off your order. Once again, that is code JC. And Zero Foxtrot, veteran founded, the big supporter of our nation's defenders and uh, law enforcement first responders. Great guys. Um, I'll be wearing a shirt that I got from them, I think about a year ago, because they do these uh, drops every now and again that are limited edition. And this is one of theirs right here. But uh, but there's this one I got, this limited edition drop from about a year ago that uh, that's pretty special. And yeah, I'll wear it, uh, I'll wear it next time. Um, very cool because it has a tie to one of my favorite authors and favorite books that inspired me growing up in the 80s. So very cool. But uh, definitely go to zerofoxtrot.com could be a slash JC, but use the code JC at checkout for 20% off that order. Once again, zero Foxtrot, use code JC at checkout for 20% off and stay zero. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. Now, since I just had Glenn Eberly on the podcast, uh, I figured I should talk about Eberly Stock Packs. Uh, this one right here is the one I talked about on the podcast. This is the Gunslinger 2 right here. And uh, this thing this thing is awesome. This is a new one. I have my Go Bag uh, downstairs, which is a bigger pack than this. I don't know exactly what model it is, but I'll, uh, I'll bring it up here at some point. But it's packed full of stuff because it's my Go Bag, um, meaning I can grab it and go. And it's got uh, a lot of gear in there. It's got my rifle in there. It's got whole, uh, first aid stuff in there, trauma gear in there, food in there, water. Um, so it's a pretty big pack. But uh, this one seems much more manageable. And um, I think I'm going to get this one set up as a uh, smaller version of that Go Bag at some point. Um, but this thing looks sweet, and I cannot wait to get out there with this one. I've had a bunch of these packs over the years. And like I talked about on the podcast, uh, Clinton, Heidi Smith, I'm pretty sure are the ones that introduced me to Everly Stock Packs years and years ago. And uh, actually, I think they gave me my my first one that I still have today. Uh, but I have a bunch of them now. And you can go to my website and go find the first video that I did for the Terminal List back in the day. I think it's on the Terminal List uh, section of the officialjackcar.com website. And you can see it there. And you just might see Chris Pratt wearing one of these in the Amazon series that's coming out July first. So that'll be pretty cool. And uh, this one here is the gun slinger. So this one is a lot smaller, um, or the gun runner, I'm sorry. This is the gun runner right here. So it's a little smaller than the gun slinger, but check them out, eberlystock.com. Uh, so many different packs on there these days, uh, and they're just awesome. And if you watched uh, or listened to the podcast with Glenn Eberly, um, you know that he is, uh, he's passionate about this and it's, uh, he has such an amazing life story. So, uh, very cool packs. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. Find out more about Glenn Eberly at eberlystock.com. Go to that about section for a great video on his background and also follow him on the social channels, Glenn Eberly Stock on Instagram and follow Eberly Stock on Instagram as 
well. My next novel, In the Blood, is coming out May 17th and is available for pre-order now. You can follow me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels. Go to officialjackcar.com for the website and Jack Carr USA for the merch. If you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to leave one of those five-star ratings and reviews to help counter the big tech algorithms. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is sincerely appreciated. Take care out there. Be safe, stay strong, keep fighting.